Hello again. Uh, our lecture today is on uh, Peter Balakian, an American Armenian uh, author, and his book, which is a memoir entitled The Black Dog of Fate. I have already spoken a little bit about him on my lecture on the Armenian genocide, which I delivered earlier, and it is posted already. And if you follow the history and uh, go through the Armenian genocide, you will understand much better uh, Peter Balakian's book, which is Black Dog of Fate. Uh, Fifteen years ago, on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of Haigazian University, uh, Haigazian invited, uh, through the uh, assistance of the American Embassy in Lebanon, uh, Peter Balakian, who came and who gave uh, three lectures in Haigazian, one on the Black Dog of Fate, one on his book called The Burning Tigress, and the third one in class uh, with students like you, who had a nice exchange on the book and asked him questions. Uh, Peter Balakian uh, is alive and living in New Jersey, and if you would like to write to him, I can always give you his email, and you can uh, write and comment on the book. Uh, he grew up in uh, Tenefly in New Jersey, and he has a BA from Buckner University and a PhD from Brown University. Uh, he lives currently in, in New York with his children. And um, originally, he was, he was a professor of uh, literature at Colgate University in, in the United States, and uh, his specialty, of course, his professional uh, spe uh, specialty and uh, specialization is in English literature and poetry. Uh, he was um, uh, well known for his poetry books, and it is always uh, interesting to see that it was late in his life that he came uh, to be aware of his Armenian identity and uh, uh, the Armenian uh, history. Uh, so, uh, if you Google today Peter Balakian, most probably you will get to most of his books are on American literature and poetry, and uh, and then much recently genocide studies and um, justice issues, identity issues, and so forth. He was re he received many awards, including the Guggenheim Fellow in 1999 the Penn Martha uh, Albrand Prize for Memoirs, New, the New Jersey Council for the Humanities book. I'm not going to go through them all. They're all listed in your, in your, in your uh, presentation. Uh, but uh, one of the greatest things that happened to him was this book, which made him aware of his identity. Now, when Peter came to Haigazian and he gave us a lecture, he told us about how he came about to write his memoir. So he comes from an Armenian-American family. His father was a doctor, uh, middle class, upper class um, uh, Armenian-American living in the suburbs of the United States. Every morning he would drive his Chevy and go to work. Uh, his mother, an Armenian who, who is also uh, who also has her mother, the grandmother, who lives in the house with them. And of course, we have also uh, aunts who are in the background. Now, uh, in his lecture, which he gave us in Haigazian, he told us very clearly that uh, as he grew up as a young American boy, he would uh, crave to be an American uh, playing uh, in the streets, uh, football and baseball with his friends, uh, and who would have uh, small TV dinners rather than the elaborate uh, cooking that his mother did at home. And here he talks about how his book has a lot of these secret codes that went around uh, in his family. On the outside, he was an American. On the inside, he was an Armenian. Inside, they had this house, which was beautifully decorated with a picture of the Ararat uh, and a cross that uh, uh, 
the, the Catholicos had brought it as a present to them from uh, Jerusalem. Uh, the Persian carpets on the floor and the eternal smell of food like dolma and sarma and in fact the first chapter that he writes he remembers how as a small boy his grandmother used to call him Bedros and his Peter he would go to the kitchen with his grandmother and make uh, chereg which is the cookies that people make during Easter time uh, a lot of braided and mahlab and, and he would say these smells I would only smell them in our house. None of the American houses had smells like that. All these spices and all these dolmas and sarmas and all these foods that were... And so for him, he starts talking about how culture is transmitted in the kitchen in most of societies. It is through this uh, kitchen experience that culture goes from one to another. He also uh, very clearly talks about uh, uh, how he, uh, as a child, he grew up as a typical American. And then uh, one day he used to, uh, you know, uh, work part time. He was a good football player, so he would do a lot of running. And once uh, uh, football and baseball and all of these uh, American games, and once as a, as a, uh, he would go and work as a delivery boy who would take checks from one office to the other uh, and then at lunchtime, he would sit and, write and read books. And one day, he picked a book from his father's library, which was the book by Henry Morgenthau, uh, which I mentioned in the other lecture, and who was the ambassador of the US in Constantinople in Turkey, and who writes about uh, the Armenian genocide in his book. It is his wake-up call. He says in every life, somebody picks a book, and it changes his life. It was his wake-up call, and he suddenly realized that uh, there's a secret in the house, that people talked about the old country, and when he asked them, they told him it never exists anymore. So where did it go, he says. Where did this old country disappear? And why is it that uh, when our parents and our aunts want to speak, they speak in that secret language, which I couldn't understand very well, except for a few words? So he knew there was a secret in the background that nobody wanted to talk about, nobody wanted to mention. And then he, he read the book and gradually came to realize that there has been a big atrocity which took place in the life of Armenians. But he thought also this was something distant, something that happened to others, not to, to him. And the only link with this old world was his grandmother. And it's nice to compare here the grandmother with Tayyip uh, Saleh's grandfather of the narrator. These are the links between the past and the present. And one day, and his grandmother was a very, very funny person. She would uh, like to watch, uh, you know, baseball games and then and watch uh, uh, American uh, league uh, uh, base, uh, football games and drink seven up and, and, you know, talk about rock and roll and things like that. But uh, somewhere in her background, there was a secret which she wouldn't share, which she wouldn't talk about. And gradually, Peter Balakian uh, realized that uh, his grandmother was a survivor of the Armenian genocide. In fact, uh, she had arrived to the United States in the early 20s with two daughters and from a previous marriage, and then had married his father, the, his grandfather. But he also came to realize that uh, uh, she had lost her entire family uh, simply because during the genocide and the massacres, she happened to be in a summer house uh, with her aunts and all the rest of the family were, uh, were, were killed. So when she arrived to Aleppo uh, and she was, she did something that no one had done before, and he thinks it's a fantastic thing that she did it at the turn of the century when still there was no human rights. She made a list, an inventory of all the things that she had lost back home. And she eventually, when she reached the United States, she went and filed a suit against the Turkish Ottoman Empire 
and asked for reclamation for everything that she had, uh, her family had lost. And he said this was, this was something that, well, that was new for the, that time. And he is very much, uh, uh, he, he, he has in his book two pages about this, about uh, how great his grandmother called Nafina was in making such a claim. And he says that the reason why people get away with impunity, with murder, is because they're not accountable and we don't ask for our rights. So it's interesting that Peter Balakian approaches this Armenian genocide not as an Armenian who is a victim, but rather as a as an American who's looking at diagnosing the, the situation and talking about what happened in a different perspective. So uh, in, in addition to the memoir which she has about how this happened and about what happened during the Armenian genocide, which has snippets of history from here and there, uh, in the last part of the book, he talks about two important things. One about April 24 and the commemoration and why it is important for the Armenians to hold this day of commemoration. He says, many people usually say, why do you keep on, uh, you Armenians, after 105 years, I mean 100 years, you keep on, uh, you know, bringing up the past? And he says, we bring up the past because the past still not passed. It hasn't passed yet. Uh, on one hand, it's very much alive in the hearts and memories of the survivors. On the other hand, the perpetrators are around and there is denial. And when you deny a murder, you commit the murder twice. You commit the genocide twice. So he talks about the trauma that the people have lived with. The first generation, like my grandfather's generation, they never talked about anything. They never mentioned that they had gone through a genocide. They wanted to spare the children. They wanted to protect them. They, wouldn't, they wanted them to grow up without any sort of uh, uh, fear or anxiety of what had happened. But the second generation, after 1965, after 50 years, the world woke up. The Armenians woke up and started writing and talking and claiming. And this started, again, to show that the wound had never healed. And he says the wound is a festering wound. It's open. And the open wound never heals unless there's a closure. And psychologically speaking, usually, usually when you lose someone you love, the closure starts after the funeral. After you go through the funeral, you come back. And in our part of the Middle East, we have all these condolences that people stay together. And these condolences help you to get over your grief. But when you lose one and a half million people who have no graves, who don't know where, you don't know where they are. Uh, my father's grandmother is somewhere in the Syrian desert. She died on the way. Uh, there is no grave. There's no name. No one knows where it is. And millions, hundreds and thousands of people like her. So where are these? So people need to have a closure, need to have a ceremony. And April 24 becomes this annual ceremony for people to have a closure, to close this. And he talks about this trauma, that how can you be an Armenian American at the same time? What does it mean for him? If he is an Armenian, then what is the role of the American in him that accepts injustice? And if he's an American, what is this Armenian in him that never stops hurting him? He says, okay, I go and visit Armenia, I come visit the Middle East. And when he came here, he said, this is the closest to the old country that I ever got to. Then he went to Derzor the next year, and he wrote about it as well. So uh, how does he deal with this reality? And he says, you cannot close People tell you, turn the page and go on. But you need to read the page before you turn the page. And Peter Balakian says, as long as there is denial, as long as there are historians today who falsify history, and as long as you, as a survivor, you know your family history, how can you live with this denial? How can you live with this masquerade? How can you tell your people this has never happened when every family has a story, every family has a survivor? So he hopes that 
with the rise of the new Turkish intelligentsia and the new journalists and the ones who are now writing history from an objective perspective, that eventually uh, the story will reveal itself. The, the, the denial will stop. Now, uh, as we come to read the book, we will go through most of the uh, uh, story. Uh, uh, there are many themes which we will discuss. Of course, one of them is genocide. The other is identity. The immigra uh, assimilation and immigration. How much do you keep part of your identity and how much like Mustafa Saeed do you stay an outsider, an exiled person everywhere? The recognition, human rights, how do you heal? How do you face the past? How do you face all the skeletons in the closet and all these uh, ghosts in your life? Uh, but also, uh, Peter Balakian talks about uh, uh, the, the importance of, uh, of talking and of sharing this. Now, um, well, many people asked him, what is the title of the book? What is this black dog of fate? And uh, his, his grandmother used to tell him many stories, folk stories coming from old Armenian stories. And one of them, that once upon a time, there was a a woman or queen who, uh, uh, you know, uh, she received this beautiful uh, uh, sheep on a, on a whole uh, uh, tray with, with almonds and things, and she rejected it. On the other hand, there was this old woman who had a dog that she wanted to give it as a present, and she cooked it, and she took it, and she accepted it. And here, he says, the folk story that he wanted to say was that there are sometimes events that happen that have no logic. Today, when people like Armenians ask, why did this happen? Some people say, you deserved it. I say, but what did we do? What was the crime we did? We tell, sometimes tell children, you deserve the punishment. But when something happens that you don't deserve, when something happens without any logical sequence, how do you deal with that? How do you justify it? How do you rationalize it? How do you go on living with something that doesn't make sense? How do you go on living when you see the murderer every day around you and nothing is done? And this is one of the things that today we talk about, you know, uh, human rights, international tribunals, uh, the Declaration of Human Rights, which has a special category on genocide as well. So uh, for Peter Balakian, uh, his grandmother says, it's pacht. Pacht is bacht, or chance, or nasib, or qismet, or something that happens. Things that happen, Machiavelli would say fortuna, you know. Things that happen without making sense, which are scary, because today we ask, why the corona? Why this all of a sudden has happened? Is God angry with us? Are we being punished? On the other hand, if you're a scientific person, you say, we have reached the moon and we can't fight a virus. Uh, what is this insignificance of the human race? Is something to be done or is nothing to be done, as Samuel Beckett says? So in, in the face of large catastrophes and tragedies, human beings are faced with this helplessness, and they try to find sense to what is happening. And when they can't find sense, they resort to interpretations and explanations. However, the bottom line remains impunity to go unpunished for crimes against humanity in the 21st century is no more acceptable. People need to deal with their past. People need to reconcile with their past so that generations can live towards the future. Both the Turkish and the Armenians need to go on living clearly and openly the Turkish new generation needs to know what was its past, what was the Ottoman Empire, and the fact that they can't read it anymore because the language has been changed to Latin alphabet makes it difficult for them to read their archives. They don't know their history. Armenians, on the other hand, need to come out. Every single person who has a grandmother at home, let her tell you stories, write it down, document it. Oral history is important as much as written history. It is important to keep the memory alive. You remember, Gogo and Didi had no memory. And if you have no memory, you have no history. 
You have to keep on keeping the memory alive so that you can have justifiable claims and get your demands. So on this week of the, of the 24th of April, as we read Peter Balakian, read the memoirs of this American Armenian, and think of this identity crisis the same way as you would deal with it if you were a Palestinian living in the United States, a Lebanese living in Australia, a Sudanese living in England, a, anybody who has this dual kind of culture, and anybody who has an unjust, unresolved claim in his life that requires justice and requires a fair uh, dealing with the impunities of the world. Uh, when Hitler uh, started massacring the Jews in 1939 and onwards, when he, they told him, be careful, he said, who remembers the Armenian massacres anymore? They're gone. Today we know that we all remember what has happened. And as long as there has been no justice, the page remains to be read. Thank you.